Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens deals with the major themes of duality, revolution, and resurrection. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times in London and Paris as economic and political unrest lead to the American and French revolutions. The main characters in Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, Dr. Alexander Manette, Charles Darnay, and Sidney Carton are all recalled to life or resurrected in different ways as turmoil erupts. If you enjoy our program, Please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify chapter I dot the period. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair, we had everything before us, we had nothing before us, we were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way in short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries, it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled forever. It was the year of our Lord 1775. Spiritual revelations were conceded to England at that favored period as at this. Mrs. Southcott had recently attained her 5 and 20th blessed birthday of whom a prophetic private in the lifeguards had heralded the sublime appearance by announcing that arrangements were made for the swallowing up of London and Westminster. Even the Cock Lane ghost had been late only a round dozen of years after wrapping out its messages as the spirits of this very year last past, supernaturally deficient in originality, wrapped out theirs. Mere messages in the earthly order of events had lately come to the English crown and people from a congress of British subjects in America, which, strange to relate, have proved more important to the human race than any communications yet received through any of the chickens of the Cock Lane brood. France, less favored on the whole as to matters spiritual than her sister of the shield and trident, rolled with exceeding smoothness downhill making paper money and spending it. Under the guidance of her Christian pastors, she entertained herself, besides, with such humane achievements as sentencing a youth to have his hands cut off, his tongue torn out with pincers, and his body burned alive, because he had not kneeled down in the rain to do honor to a dirty procession of monks which passed within his view, at a distance of some fifty or sixty yards. It is likely enough that, rooted in the woods of France and Norway, there were growing trees when that sufferer was put to death, already marked by the woodman, fate, to come down and be sawn into boards, to make a certain movable framework with a sack and a knife in it, terrible in history. It is likely enough that in the rough outhouses of some tillers of the heavy lands adjacent to Paris, there were sheltered from the weather that very day, rude carts, bespattered with rustic mire, snuffed about by pigs, and roosted in by poultry, which the farmer, Death, had already set apart to be his tumbrils of the revolution. 
But that woodman and that farmer, though they work unceasingly, work silently, and no one heard them as they went about with muffled tread, the rather, for as much as to entertain any suspicion that they were awake, was to be atheistical and traitorous. In England, there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night. Families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town without removing their furniture to upholsterers' warehouses for security. The highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light and being recognized and challenged by his fellow tradesmen whom he stopped in his character of the captain, gallantly shot him through the head and rode away. The mail was waylaid by seven robbers and the guard shot three dead and then got shot dead himself by the other four in consequence of the failure of his ammunition after which the mail was robbed in peace. That magnificent potentate, the Lord Mayor of London, was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman who despoiled the illustrious creature in sight of all his retinue. Prisoners in London jails fought battles with their turnkeys, and the majesty of the law fired blunderbusses in among them, loaded with rounds of shot and ball. Thieves snipped off diamond crosses from the necks of noble lords at court drawing rooms. Musketeers went into St. Giles's to search for contraband goods, and the mob fired on the musketeers, and the musketeers fired on the mob, and nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. In the midst of them, the hangman, ever busy and ever worse than useless, was in constant requisition. Now, stringing up long rows of miscellaneous criminals, now hanging a housebreaker on Saturday who had been taken on Tuesday, now burning people in the hand at Newgate by the dozen, and now burning pamphlets at the door of Westminster Hall, today taking the life of an atrocious murderer, and tomorrow of a wretched pilfer who had robbed a farmer's boy of sixpence. All these things, and a thousand like them, came to pass in and close upon the dear old year 1775. Environed by them, while the woodman and the farmer worked unheeded, those two of the large jaws, and those other two of the plain and the fair faces, trod with stir enough, and carried their divine rights with a high hand. Thus did the year 1775 conduct their greatnesses, and myriads of small creatures the creatures of this chronicle among the rest along the roads that lay before them. Chapter 2. The Mail It was the Dover Road that lay, on a Friday night late in November, before the first of the persons with whom this history has business. The Dover Road lay, as to him, beyond the Dover Mail, as it lumbered up Shooter's Hill. He walked uphill in the mire by the side of the mail, as the rest of the passengers did, not because they had the least relish for walking exercise under the circumstances, but because the hill and the harness and the mud and the mail were all so heavy that the horses had three times already come to a stop, besides once drawing the coach across the road with the mutinous intent of taking it back to Blackheath. Reins and whip and coachman and guard, however, in combination, had read that article of war which forbade a purpose otherwise strongly in favor of the argument that some brute animals are endued with reason and the team had capitulated and returned to their duty. With drooping heads and tremulous tails, they mashed their way through the thick mud, floundering and stumbling between wiles, as if they were falling to pieces at the larger joints. As often as the driver rested them and brought them to a stand with a wary waho. So ho then, the near leader violently shook his head and everything upon it like an unusually emphatic horse, denying that the coach could be got up the hill. Whenever the leader made this rattle, the passenger started as a nervous passenger might and was disturbed in mind. There was a steaming mist in all the hollows, and it had roamed in its forlornness up the hill like an evil spirit, 
seeking rest and finding none. A clammy and intensely cold mist, it made its slow way through the air in ripples that visibly followed and overspread one another as the waves of an unwholesome sea might do. It was dense enough to shut out everything from the light of the coach lamps, but these its own workings and a few yards of road and the reek of the laboring horses steamed into it as if they had made it all. Two other passengers, besides the one, were plodding up the hill by the side of the mail. All three were wrapped to the cheekbones and over the ears and wore jack boots. Not one of the three could have said from anything he saw what either of the other two was like and each was hidden under almost as many wrappers from the eyes of the mind as from the eyes of the body of his two companions. In those days, travelers were very shy of being confidential on a short notice for anybody on the road might be a robber or in league with robbers. As to the latter, when every posting house and alehouse could produce somebody in the captain's pay, ranging from the landlord to the lowest stable nondescript, it was the likeliest thing upon the cards. So the guard of the Dover Mail thought to himself that Friday night in November 1775, lumbering up Shooter's Hill as he stood on his own particular perch behind the mail, beating his feet and keeping an eye and a hand on the arm chest before him where a loaded blunderbuss lay at the top of six or eight loaded horse pistols deposited on a substratum of cutlass. The Dover mail was in its usual genial position that the guard suspected the passengers, the passengers suspected one another and the guard, they all suspected everybody else and the coachman was sure of nothing but the horses as to which cattle he could with a clear conscience have taken his oath on the two testaments that they were not fit for the journey. Waho, said the coachman. So, then, one more pull and you're at the top and be damned to you, for I have had trouble enough to get you to it, Joe. Hello, the guard replied. What o'clock do you make it, Joe? Ten minutes, good, past eleven. My blood, ejaculated the vexed coachman, and not a top of shooters yet. T.S.T. Yeah. Get on with you. The emphatic horse, cut short by the whip in a most decided negative, made a decided scramble for it, and the three other horses followed suit. Once more, the Dover Mail struggled on, with the jackboots of its passengers squashing along by its side. They had stopped when the coach stopped, and they kept close company with it. If any one of the three had had the hardihood to propose to another to walk on a little ahead into the mist and darkness, he would have put himself in a fair way of getting shot instantly as a highwayman. The last burst carried the mail to the summit of the hill. The horses stopped to breathe again and the guard got down to skid the wheel for the descent and opened the coach door to let the passengers in. T.S.T. Joe cried the coachman in a warning voice looking down from his box. What do you say, Tom? They both listened. I say a horse at a canter coming up, Joe. I say a horse at a gallop, Tom, returned the guard, leaving his hold of the door and mounting nimbly to his place. Gentlemen, in the king's name, all of you. With this hurried adjuration, he cocked his blunderbuss and stood on the offensive. The passenger booked by this history was on the coach step, getting in, the two other passengers were close behind him and about to follow. He remained on the step, half in the coach and half out of, they remained in the road below him. They all looked from the coachman to the guard and from the guard to the coachman and listened. The coachman looked back and the guard looked back and even the emphatic leader pricked up his ears and looked back 
without contradicting. The stillness consequent on the cessation of the rumbling and laboring of the coach added to the stillness of the night made it very quiet indeed. The panting of the horses communicated a tremulous motion to the coach as if it were in a state of agitation. The hearts of the passengers beat loud enough perhaps to be heard, but at any rate, the quiet pause was audibly expressive of people out of breath and holding the breath and having the pulses quickened by expectation. The sound of a horse at a gallop came fast and furiously up the hill. Soho, the guard sang out as loud as he could roar. Yo there, stand, I shall fire. The pace was suddenly checked and with much splashing and floundering, a man's voice called from the mist, is that the Dover Mail? Never you mind what it is, the guard retorted. What are you? Is that the Dover Mail? Why do you want to know? I want a passenger, if it is. What passenger? Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Our booked passenger showed in a moment that it was his name. The guard, the coachman, and the two other passengers eyed him distrustfully. Keep where you are, the guard called to the voice in the mist, because if I should make a mistake, it could never be set right in your lifetime. Gentlemen of the name of Lori answer straight. What is the matter? asked the passenger, then with mildly quavering speech. Who wants me? Is it Jerry? I don't like Jerry's voice. If it is Jerry, growled the guard to himself. He's hoarser than suits me, is Jerry. Yes, Mr. Lorry. What is the matter? A dispatch sent after you from over yonder. T and company. I know this messenger, guard, said Mr. Lorry, getting down into the road assisted from behind more swiftly than politely by the other two passengers who immediately scrambled into the coach, shut the door, and pulled up the window. He may come close, there's nothing wrong. I hope there ain't, but I can't make some nation sure of that, said the guard in gruff soliloquy. Hello you. Well, and hello you, said Jerry more hoarsely than before. Come on at a foot pace. Do ye mind me? And if you've got holsters to that saddle, oh yarn, don't let me see your hand go nigh em. For I'm a devil at a quick mistake, and when I make one it takes the form of lead. So now let's look at you. The figures of a horse and rider came slowly through the eddying mist and came to the side of the mail where the passenger stood. The rider stooped and, casting up his eyes at the guard, handed the passenger a small folded paper. The rider's horse was blown and both horse and rider were covered with mud from the hoofs of the horse to the hat of the man. Guard, said the passenger in a tone of quiet business confidence. The watchful guard, with his right hand at the stock of his raised blunderbuss, his left at the barrel, and his eye on the horseman, answered curtly, Sir, there is nothing to apprehend. I belong to Telson's Bank. You must know Telson's Bank in London. I am going to Paris on business. A crown to drink. I may read this. If so be as you're quick, sir. He opened it in the light of the coach lamp on that side and read first to himself and then aloud, wait at Dover for Mamsell. It's not long, you see, guard. Jerry, say that my answer was, recalled to life. Jerry started in his saddle. 
That's a blazing strange answer, too, said he at his horsest. Take that message back and they will know that I received this as well as if I wrote. Make the best of your way. Good night. With those words, the passenger opened the coach door and got in, not at all assisted by his fellow passengers who had expeditiously secreted their watches and purses in their boots and were now making a general pretense of being asleep. With no more definite purpose than to escape the hazard of originating any other kind of action. The coach lumbered on again with heavier wreaths of mist closing round it as it began the descent. The guard soon replaced his blunderbuss in his arm chest and, having looked to the rest of its contents and having looked to the supplementary pistols that he wore in his belt, looked to a smaller chest beneath his seat in which there were a few smith's tools, a couple of torches, and a tinderbox. For he was furnished with that completeness that if the coach lamps had been blown and stormed out, which did occasionally happen, he had only to shut himself up inside, keep the flint and steel sparks well off the straw, and get a light with tolerable safety and ease, if he were lucky, in five minutes. Tom, softly over the coach roof, Hello, Joe. Did you hear the message? I did, Joe. What did you make of it, Tom? Nothing at all, Joe. That's a coincidence, too, the guard mused, for I made the same of it myself. Jerry, left alone in the mist and darkness, dismounted meanwhile, not only to ease his spent horse, but to wipe the mud from his face and shake the wet out of his hat brim, which might be capable of holding about half a gallon. After standing with the bridle over his heavily splashed arm until the wheels of the mail were no longer within hearing and the night was quite still again, he turned to walk down the hill. After that there galloped from Temple Bar, old lady, I won't trust your forelegs till I get you on the level, said this horse messenger glancing at his mare. Recalled to life. That's a blazing strange message. Much of that wouldn't do for you, Jerry. I say, Jerry, you'd be in a blazing bad way if recalling to life was to come into fashion, Jerry. Chapter 3 The Night Shadows A wonderful fact to reflect upon that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. A solemn consideration when I enter a great city by night that every one of those darkly clustered houses encloses its own secret, that every room in every one of them encloses its own secret, that every beating heart in the hundreds of thousands of breasts there is, in some of its imaginings, a secret to the heart nearest it. Something of the awfulness, even of death itself, is referable to this. No more can I turn the leaves of this dear book that I loved and vainly hope in time to read it all. No more can I look into the depths of this unfathomable water wherein, as momentary lights glanced into it, I have had glimpses of buried treasure and other things submerged. It was appointed that the book should shut with a spring forever and forever when I had read but a page. It was appointed that the water should be locked in an eternal frost when the light was playing on its surface and I stood in ignorance on the shore. My friend is dead, my neighbor is dead, my love, the darling of my soul, is dead. It is the inexorable consolidation and perpetuation of the secret that was always in that individuality and which I shall carry in mind to my life's end. In any of the burial places of this city through which I pass, is there a sleeper more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are in their innermost personality to me or than I am to them? As to this, his natural and not to be alienated inheritance the messenger on horseback had exactly the same possessions as the king, 
the first minister of state or the richest merchant in London. So with the three passengers shut up in the narrow compass of one lumbering old mail coach, they were mysteries to one another, as complete as if each had been in his own coach and six, or his own coach and sixty, with the breadth of a county between him and the next. The messenger rode back at an easy trot, stopping pretty often at ill houses by the way to drink, but evincing a tendency to keep his own counsel and to keep his hat cocked over his eyes. He had eyes that assorted very well with that decoration, being of a surface black, with no depth in the color or form, and much too near together as if they were afraid of being found out in something, singly, if they kept too far apart. They had a sinister expression under an old cocked hat like a three-cornered spittoon and over a great muffler for the chin and throat which descended nearly to the wearer's knees. When he stopped for drink, he moved this muffler with his left hand only while he poured his liquor in with his right. As soon as that was done, he muffled again. No, Jerry, no, said the messenger harping on one theme as he rode. It wouldn't do for you, Jerry. Jerry, you honest tradesman, it wouldn't suit your line of business. Recalled Dash. Bust me if I don't think he'd been a drinking. His message perplexed his mind to that degree that he was fain, several times, to take off his hat to scratch his head except on the crown, which was raggedly bald, he had stiff, black hair, standing jaggedly all over it and growing downhill almost to his broad, blunt nose. It was so like Smith's work, so much more like the top of a strongly spiked wall than a head of hair, that the best of players at Leapfrog might have declined him as the most dangerous men in the world to go over. While he trotted back with the message he was to deliver to the night watchman in his box at the door of Telson's bank by Temple Bar, who was to deliver it to greater authorities within, the shadows of the night took such shapes to him as arose out of the message, and took such shapes to the mare as arose out of her private topics of uneasiness. They seemed to be numerous, for she shied at every shadow on the road. What time? The mail coach lumbered, jolted, rattled, and bumped upon its tedious way with its three fellow inscrutables inside. To whom, likewise, the shadows of the night revealed themselves in the forms their dozing eyes and wandering thoughts suggested. Telson's bank had a run upon it in the mail. As the bank passenger with an arm drawn through the leathern strap which did what lay in it to keep him from pounding against the next passenger and driving him into his corner whenever the coach got a special jolt nodded in his place with half-shut eyes, the little coach windows and the coach lamp dimly gleaming through them and the bulky bundle of opposite passenger became the bank and did a great stroke of business. The rattle of the harness was the chink of money and more drafts were honored in five minutes than even Telson's, with all its foreign and home connection ever paid in thrice the time. Then the strong rooms underground at Telson's, with such of their valuable stores and secrets as were known to the passenger, and it was not a little that he knew about them, opened before him, and he went in among them with the great keys and the feebly burning candle, and found them safe and strong and sound and still, just as he had last seen them. But, though the bank was almost always with him, and though the coach, in a confused way, like the presence of pain under an opiate, was always with him, there was another current of impression that never ceased to run all through the night. He was on his way to dig someone out of a grave. Now which of the multitude of faces that showed themselves before him was the true face of the buried person the shadows of the night did not indicate, but they were all the faces of a man of five and forty by years, and they differed principally in the passions they expressed and in the ghastliness of their worn and wasted state. Pride, contempt, defiance, 
stubbornness, submission, lamentation, succeeded one another, so did varieties of sunken cheek, cadaverous color, emaciated hands and figures. But the face was in the main one face, and every head was prematurely white. A hundred times the dozing passenger inquired of this specter. Buried how long? The answer was always the same, almost 18 years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out? Long ago. You know that you are recalled to life? They tell me so. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Shall I show her to you? Will you come and see her? The answers to this question were various and contradictory. Sometimes the broken reply was, wait. It would kill me if I saw her too soon. Sometimes it was given in a tender rain of tears and then it was, take me to her. Sometimes it was staring and bewildered and then it was, I don't know her. I don't understand. After such imaginary discourse, the passenger in his fancy would dig and dig, dig now with a spade, now with a great key, now with his hands to dig this wretched creature out. Got out at last, with earth hanging about his face and hair, he would suddenly fan away to dust. The passenger would then start to himself and lower the window to get the reality of mist and rain on his cheek. Yet even when his eyes were opened on the mist and rain, on the moving patch of light from the lamps and the hedge at the roadside retreating by jerks, the night shadows outside the coach would fall into the train of the night shadows within. The real banking house by Temple Bar, the real business of the past day, the real strong rooms, the Rayall Express sent after him and the real message returned would all be there. Out of the midst of them, the ghostly face would rise and he would accost it again. Buried how long? Almost 18 years. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Dig, dig, dig until an impatient movement from one of the two passengers would admonish him to pull up the window, draw his arm securely through the leathern strap and speculate upon the two slumbering forms until his mind lost its hold of them and they again slid away into the bank and the grave. Buried how long? Almost 18 years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out? Long ago. The words were still in his hearing as just spoken distinctly in his hearing as ever spoken words had been in his life when the weary passenger started to the consciousness of daylight and found that the shadows of the night were gone. He lowered the window and looked out at the rising sun. There was a ridge of plowed land with a plow upon it where it had been left last night when the horses were unyoked beyond a quiet coppice wood in which many leaves of burning red and golden yellow still remained upon the trees. Though the earth was cold and wet, the sky was clear and the sun rose bright, placid and beautiful. Eighteen years, said the passenger, looking at the sun, gracious creator of day. To be buried alive for eighteen years.